Hello, hello. My name is Ethan Zildner, and you're listening to The Hoop and the Harm, a weekly podcast about basketball, sports, and other stuff like that. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Eldon Mims, a former professional basketball player. Um, we're based out of London, Ontario, Canada, and that's where I met Elvin, actually. We met when he was a former London Lightning player, and yeah, we're going to go from there. So I want you to say hello to everybody. Hi, hi everybody. Going out there today. And uh, so just to get everything started, Elvin was a former fringe NBA player for his time, which is very close and a very hard thing to achieve. And one of the things we're going to talk about in this is how he got there and what brought him to that level and how he worked hard to get to where he achieved. So, Elvin, where did you start off? What high school did you go to and where are you from? Um, from um, a small town in Florida. It's by the name of Sanford. Um, a lot of talent out of there. So, um, I went to the school, Northview High School, um, where I was, you know, an elite athlete, basketball starter, and then I went on to the junior college. Uh, at the time, it was called Okaloosa Walton Community College. Now, I think it's called um, Gulf. North Florida State or something like that. It actually turned into like a small four year. Um, and from there, I got a full scholarship from the University of Southern Mississippi. And, um, Which is not an easy thing to achieve. Yeah, so, um, I mean, after that, you know, I had offers, you know, to, you know, from there to, you know, play professionally. So, it was all on that. So, my next question is, what uh, got you started with basketball? How did you get going with it? Um, that started, I was, you know, probably 14. Um, and I had my cousins and some neighborhood friends that came and then asked me to play. You know, they had to have a certain amount of players to have a junior varsity team at the time. And it was either do that or sit at home and be bored while they were doing that. So, yeah, I just jumped in on it and, Let's you know, do just, it. Yeah, I just kind of found out I was pretty good at it. So. And you were always 6'5", 240 pounds, yeah? No, not at all. What? I was, I was pretty small. Graduated, I was probably about 6'1", and some change, maybe scratching 6'2". Buck seventy five. So you grew into yourself. Yeah, I grew into the growth spurt, you know, once I got to college. So um so you're in high school in Florida, you're playing around, you're actually getting pretty good. Yeah. How old are you when you start thinking, hey, I might be able to turn something into this, I might be able to do something with this? Oh, well, I was probably about my junior year of high school, you know, we're just sitting down thinking, you know, looking at you know, highlights, that's when you're all about you know, the dunk and everything. It just kind of dawned on me then that like, I can probably actually, you know, go somewhere doing this here. And I knew, you know, with my situation, if my parents had to pay for me to go to college, I probably wouldn't have went. So it was either, you know, a sports scholarship or, you know, cross your fingers to hope you get an academic scholarship. So. so you just said, screw it. Why not? Did you have, um, did you have any offers from Division One schools or was it you just went to community college and worked your way up? Uh, no, I had offers from small, they were very small universities. Um, a lot of them that you, you know, you probably have to go to Google, you know, just <laughs> actually look them up. But I mean, they were small. Um, I just decided, you know, to go to junior college was my decision. I knew physically I wasn't ready to, you know, to go to university. And honestly, mentally, I don't think Just I be a red shirt the first year and do nothing? Yeah, I just didn't want to go somewhere where I would have to, you know, sit on the bench and kind of become like a, a work in progress. So who helped of. prepare you get ready for university for community college? Was it just yourself? Did Say I got to do this myself, or did you go see a coach? No, um, actually, my coach, um, you know, may rest in peace. Now it's Bruce Stewart, was a real good guy. Um, he saw me at um, like a camp, a high school camp, and he walked up and talked to me and told me like the way I played, the way I carried myself, and you know, I'd be hearing from him. And he gave me a card, and I was just like, I, you know, he didn't think much of it. Never didn't think much of it. But then it was probably like a few days after that, you know, my high school coach came to me and was. You know, was telling me that this college was interested. So went on a visit and stuff. And he didn't. The one thing I noticed, he never made any promises. He didn't promise I was going to come in and start. He just told me I was going to have to work, right? So I mean, if you're doing that and you know, playing in the neighborhood that I was at, you know, we never really played with kids. We always played with grown men. And I think that was what really, you know, got me ready for the next level is the physicality, you know, the mental part of just playing with like full grown men, right? So. Well, fair enough. Um, so, you're at community college. You're busting everyone's butt there. You're doing well. Um, did you just think, hey, you know, I'm just going to go to community college, get a degree, and just go work a regular job like everybody else? Or when did you start thinking, A, I want to try and go to Division One and try to turn this into a professional career, and B, um, what were the 
the steps you had to take. It was, obviously, you can't just go, all right, I want to go play Division One basketball. No, it was actually, um, it was, it was, it was a process, to be honest with you. I mean, I didn't go to junior college to say, okay, I want to just get a two-year degree and be done. I mean, ultimately, you want to try to get that, that offer, you know, to the next step, you know. But, you know, I was just fortunate enough and blessed enough to have people that, you know, came around me at the time that would give me insight and give me the possibilities and, you know, just give everything to me straight so that when I do make that decision, I can kind of base it off of more reality than anything else. Oh, fair enough. Um, so then you are you go to the University of Southern Mississippi? Yeah. That's where you went. Um, who, con- who contacted you from there? Oh, it's actually, um, it was the coach. His name was James Green. Um, he contacted uh, my coach, Bruce Stewart, there at the time, and, you know, they said they had interest, and, you know, I met with them and quite a few coaches, but, you know, I decided to go there. It was close to the home. You know, only like two and a half. What were other hours. offers you had, if you don't mind me asking? Um, at the time, I had offers from Georgia, South Florida, Cincinnati. Um, the, it was like some mid, you know, some more smaller universities and things like that. But um, I would say at that time, that's when Cincinnati, you know, was actually a power out there. Bob Huggins there. Good. Yeah, yeah they were strong. It was, it was there, so, I mean, I had... Like I said, South Florida, Louisville, uh, it was, that's when they was in Conference USA as well, right? So, you know, um, in that conference, they did a lot of recruiting from junior colleges, so. Oh, shit. Um, so, you're playing at the University of Southern Mississippi. You're doing well there again, too. What's your next step? How did you, how did you feel about trying to get to the NBA or playing professionally? Because obviously there's a lot of Division One athletes and a lot of guys who are going to compete for getting an NBA job. How did you feel you were going to be able to separate yourself? Um, I have to say that the one thing about it at Southern Miss was the fact that, you know, they hung their hat on defense, right? So it wasn't like I was a one-dimensional player, you know, like I could play on both ends of the floor and play multiple positions. Um, you know, I can't say at that point, I was never thinking about any other type of professional ball other than the NBA. You just get tunnel vision, NBA, well, yeah, NBA, NBA. You aim right? for the moon and you hit yeah, it off the start. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how right? it was, right? And, you know, that's when I actually had, um, you know, a couple of agents contact me. And, you know, that's when I sat down and I actually spoke with my coach, Bruce Stewart, and I was telling him about it. And, you know, it was just like, hey, the reality of it is, is that, you know, it's a very small chance that, the NBA will happen. I'm not saying that it won't. So well, the draft is only yeah. 60 spots. Yeah. So, yeah, you have that, and, you know, you're dealing with that. And, you know, so it's like, you know, you have good overseas markets and, and things like that. So, I mean, that was very, like, influential on my decision. But, I mean, I never went in saying, you know, or thinking any other professional than the NBA, right? So, I mean, that's... That's the goal that's, you got yeah, so yeah. that's what I was, that's what I was striving for. And I think in the midst of that, I just took everything head on and just... You know, just endure it like that. Well, okay, so you okay, so you were almost playing for the Golden State Warriors and the Atlanta Hawks. You were at the vet camp for both of them, correct? I was at mini camp with the Hawks, and I went to vet camp for Golden State. Mini camp yeah. and vet camp, and then so you're done at the University of Southern Mississippi. You've done your four years of college and all that stuff. Um, it's the summer after you're done. Who's contacting you? What What are you also doing? to keep yourself busy so you're you're trying to get yourself ready to be a professional athlete. Like, who's contacted you at this point? So I mean, well, you have an agent. I had an agent at the time. So, you How'd know, you get him? Um, he just, you know, he wound up finding me, actually, at Southern Miss and sat down and had a meeting with him and, you know, like the guy went on, so I decided to go with him. So, you know, I would get phone calls from him saying, you know, hey, we have this team interested. You know, they want to fly you out and do a workout and, you know, things of that nature. You get all your accommodations Everything, taken care yeah, of when you, you were there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, your flights, your hotels, you know, they give you per diem, you know, and it's, so that's just, you know, it's a fine little gig once you're doing that, but it it's also, bad. yeah, it's also business at the same time, right? And you gotta be professional, yeah, very, sure. And it gets very tiring, right? I mean, you, you have, a, you know, you might have, you know, three workouts in a week, you know, you might, you might How have... How long is a workout? An hour and a half. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to a couple hours, two and a half hours, sometimes three. You know, they want to do their own test in there. They're going to sit you down. They're going to talk with you. And it's not like you're just going in and saying, okay, we're going to go and pick five spots, and you go five, five, and five, and three, and then just one dribble and none no, of They're going to have you busting against some vets or No, it's not agents. It's not really that. They're bringing other free agents. You know, free agents, they have other people that's coming in. Rookies or no? Yeah, a lot of, you know, some 
rookies and you're doing a lot of one on one, two on two, three on three. Um, you're doing a lot of three on three, four court. You know, it's just, that's just to see how you react and just stuff. Just to see, like, you know, just to see how you play. Basically, it makes you play right. It opens the floor up more. You get a little more wind. So, if you don't mind saying, who were some of the guys you went up against while you were playing against in the Atlanta Hawks uh, mini camp or the Golden oh, State well, Warriors back camp? I was at the mini camp. I was there. It was, you had Janeiro Fargo. Um, you had Damian Wilkins. Oh, Damian yeah, Wilkins. yeah, you had them. And then you had like, a lot of <laughs> other just like free agent guys, right? Because that's when the summer league was really just starting to kick off as well, right? So, yeah. The D League when you were playing wasn't really a thing either, so that's so, kind of. Honestly, when I came up, they didn't have a D League. It was a CBA, correct? It was a CBA. And, um, so I was there, and then, like I said, I wound up going to Golden State the back camp, and that's when, like, you know, it was kind of overwhelming thing right there. You know, that was after the draft had come and passed, right? So, you know, that happened. And, you, and know, you applied for the draft and stuff? Or yeah, or? I, like, I declared for the draft or whatnot. You don't just draft. go outside and be like, I declared for the NBA draft. No, you just. You let your agent know, and they go a lot, you know, doing all the things. They represent you for the NBA yeah, stuff. everything that happens or whatnot. And then, um, you know, so the draft comes and go. You don't get drafted. You're a little, you know, pissed off. You're a little, you know, a little chip on your shoulder. Yeah, you're just aggravated, right? Because I think then it just it boils down to how political it can get sometimes too, right? Like, and, and that's the thing a lot of people don't understand. But, you know, you learn, you live, you learn and whatnot. So I wound up going to the next camp and go to state. And that's when I was actually there with that's when you see like the guys, right? You know, that guys you see on TV. And yeah, stuff, at yeah. that time you're on the same court plan and it's Antoine Jameson and Gilbert oh, Arenas and Jason Richardson and Troy Murphy, like and, and they were all big guys, right? I mean they knew the you know the, the situation. You're getting paid millions of dollars to play basketball, I'm sure the cool guys are Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying, right? You get paid a million, you know, millions on millions and you go do something you'll probably do every day, right? So Um, so you're at the camps, you're doing well, you unfortunately don't make it. How did that? How did they approach you? How does that go down? Oh, were they professionals about it, yeah, or were they just? they're professional. I mean, they, they call you in, and they, you know, you you kind of learn the other side of the business, right? You, you think you go in and oh, I went in and I had a good day shooting. I'm here, you know. You played well. You think you did that? You think you did everything right? It's just so much other stuff that goes on. You know, it, it goes on with, with roster moves. You know, and with the roster being so limiting, because back then I believe they could only have 15 guys on salary, the salary cap was a lot different than what it is now, and there was no D-League teams with one-to-one -one affiliations, do you feel like you could have cracked maybe the Atlanta Hawks roster for the D-League team, or the Santa Cruz Warriors for the Warriors, potentially? I think I probably would have, if they Easily? had the D-League yeah. team at that time. Because you played in leagues about the same caliber, yeah? No, well, actually, when I told you I played in the CBA, you know, they had that draft, I went number one overall to the Yakima Sun team. Which was no joke at the time. Yeah. Like, for instance, any Raptor fans out there, Derek Martin played in the CBA. Yeah, you had that. And, um, you know, well, another player you know, that was drafted fairly high in it was Reggie Evans, right? He played with the Raptors as well. Um, but 10 or 12 year guy in the NBA. Yeah, too. so I mean, you have that. And that's just where, like, all the guys. So the NBA at the time, that's where they did their call ups from. Yeah, if anyone's wondering what the CBA is, if you're Google searching it, that it was a league that was established a couple years back. And. There was no G League or D League that it's called now. Um, that's where players were trying to come up and go, get going. That's where they'd go. The D League was still around at the time, but they, there wasn't really an NBA affiliation yet. The NBA was just kind of saying, you guys can do your own thing. But, yeah, the CBA was the best drawing place to get any good NBA talent for these players. Well, I think I actually I was in the CBA for uh, maybe three years before the D League. Started taking off? No, before it actually you know, came too, because, you know, once the D-League started, teams from the CBA went, like the, um, the Sioux Falls Sky Force, the, the Dakota Wizards, um, the Idaho Stampede, Another you know, yeah, team. like you had those teams that went over to the D-League, right? That's because they had those affiliations with the NBA teams. But prior to, you know, you have guys that get cut from NBA roster, don't go overseas, they was in the CBA. You have good guys that come from overseas, but not at the NBA roster, they came to the CBA. Like, that's where, you know, the, all the calls ups, that's where, basically, if you wasn't in the NBA, that's where they were. get the back problem. in there. That's right, where yeah. they was at, you know. So. so then, you're in the CBA. What's your next move? Do you start saying, you know, fuck the NBA. I don't need this shit. I'm going to go do my own thing. I don't need. I'm going to try and make my own money somewhere else. And it's not, not to sound bitter, not to come off as, you know, uh, they don't want me. It's just. There's only like around 300 athletes you can have in the NBA, and unfortunately, they're just high, 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 high-end athletes. Yeah. 
And like we were saying before, you didn't have the D-League where you could have basically another 16 guys on your roster to run through the stuff you were doing, the systems they want, and to basically groom you to become a better player if you're a raw prospect. So you start moving around overseas. Where do you start going? Oh, well, my first gig, I was in high school. Um, How'd you like that? It was okay. It was different. You know, it was with it being the, the first. Oh, white women? <laughs> <laughs> with it being the very first, like, um, you know, gig that I had. It was almost overwhelming, right? Because you don't know what they expect. It's your first overseas bill, you know, wasn't getting paid a gang of money or whatnot, but I was like, hey, you know, just playing They still gave you good accommodations? Yeah, I mean, they give you a place to stay, they give you a car, you know, things of that nature, you know, which is kind of typical once you hit the overseas market. But, you know, I went there for, you know, a season, and then, you know, I came back, and then that's when I started playing back in the CBA again, so. Wait, you came back? Yeah, I came back. Um, so then you bounced around from the CBA to overseas, CBA overseas. Yes, and then they had, um, then it went to, from there to the PBL, the Premier Basketball League. Which is in? It's in the States, too. I mean, oh, okay. It's, it's in the States, so it was like, you know, you had like the NBA, and then you had the, the D-League, and then it went to the PBL, right? That was your overall yeah. ranking? Yeah, but I mean, it was, you know, a bunch of good guys there. A lot of them that I know, and you know, I was playing for a coach that I, you know, played against for a little while, and know him pretty well too. So, I mean, the money was it was okay, but it was just more at that point. It was just once you learn the the business, you know, you find out when you're not getting those big, those big paying jobs, whether it be the NBA overseas or whatnot, you just want to get you a good. A good one where, you're, one nice pants where out, you're comfortable at, you know, and it was just, you was comfortable, you know, you was winning, and everybody was just happy. Well, where was a good situation that you're looking back that you actually like? And if you need to get comfortable, by the way, you kind of shift around or whatever. Oh, uh, I'll say, like, uh, it would have to be either Yakima in Washington or in Oklahoma. You know, it's just because of the style of play, the guys that I was playing with, it was just... Overall, it was just, it was like no question, right? Like, we came out. We, you guys played as a good team. Played good as a unit. Everybody knew their role, you know. Well, you were saying, was that the team where basically, if you looked at the stat sheet, everyone played like 24 minutes? It yeah, was that was when I was in Oklahoma. Yeah, in the, in the PBL, man. It was, everybody, we had, you know, 10 guys, and nine of us averaged double figures. The other one was right there at it, you know, so it was just. Nobody this is a well-balanced scoring machine there. Yeah, because, I mean, everybody thinks that, or I seem to think that you have to go out and you know, put up 30 a night, you know, to get an overseas job or to get a look in the NBA. No, no, they need, they need professionals. Yeah, they want professionals, right? They want professionals. And, I mean, they look at the stats. So, if you got five guys, and they're looking at a guy, and he's only averaging, like, 12, but they look at the other guys he's playing with, and they look, okay, well, these guys are no slouches, and they're all averaging around with that. I mean, that speaks volume for your game, right? So, yeah, and it's and, it, like there's certain things on the stat sheet that don't show up too that coaches look for. Not like you said, not everyone is a 30 point a night scorer because if that's a thing, then you're going to be in the NBA, right? Yeah, and I mean, this guy, I'm a, a coach that I play for, a you know, well known NBA player, Michael Ray Rissi. I mean, he, former he, Lightning coach. Yeah, he said it the best. He was like, you know, they, they got guys that they pay. A hundred million to an NBA to score. So if you don't get that, you have to do something else. They're yeah, and Michael Ray Richardson yeah. was like an all defensive. Yeah, but they're not going to they're not going to bring you in to score the basketball. Like that's like right now, if, if the Toronto Raptors came down here to talk to me or you, they're not bringing us in and they're not coming. Like, we need you to come yeah. in and get us twenty a night. That's what they're giving Demar Derozan that money for. That's, that's what yeah. they, that's what they're giving. Too, he's gonna say yeah, Demar Carroll. That's what they're giving Valanciunas and you know possibly Ibaka. That's, <laughs> that's what they're giving them that money for us to put the ball in the hole. They come in. They want you to come in and bring in the other intangibles. You know, I want you to come in and you know knock down your open shots. Well, I think you showed me your your resume one time or a scouting report from a different team, and they were saying how. Basically, the whole thing I was reading over it was just he's a sound defensive player. He's smart. He plays within his game, and doesn't make mistakes. And that's what NBA teams want too. They don't just want they want a score. They can find a score. They want they want intangibles and defense because those are the things that are going to separate you from everybody else that are going to try and go sign. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, you know, in the grand scheme of it all, that's what that's what separates to me personally. That's what separates Kawhi from a lot of 
of him. Like but James Harden. Yeah, that's what separates him from me. Because you'd rather have Kawhi than James? Yes, I would. He yeah. brings it on. Like, you're going to get something on both ends of the floor. You know True. what I'm saying? That's just what it is. Like, you can put him on the best guy, and he'll get you 20 points, and, no problem. Yeah, you can put him on the best. You Like, let's say they play the Cavs, right? You can put him on LeBron, and he's, he's going to make his night, night, yeah. Yeah, night tough. And then he can come down on the end. So what he does in hindsight is he, he makes the other team, you know, have to work on both ends of the floor, the other superstar, whoever, right? So... I mean, that's what they look for, and I thought, you know, I kind of realized that earlier. I tried to, like, kind of mold my game, you know, behind that, you know, just not being a one-dimensional player, being able to, you know, contribute. By the way, that's my key jazz, if anyone's wondering, meowing. <laughs> yeah, just being able to contribute on both ends of the floor, so um, yeah, it just worked out fairly well. Um, so then, you're playing professionally for how long now? Uh, when I retired, I played 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. So you played at age 22 to 36? Yeah. 22 to 36. Yeah. Um, so you, I met you actually. The way, oh, boy, Jasmine. Um, I met you while you were playing with the Lightning. I believe it was your second last season. You were doing private workouts with them. I just wanted to do it because I felt like trying it out. And um, Jesus. Um, what brought you to London? Like, that's, I remember looking you up, and they said, oh, you know, you're going to work out with Elvin Mims. He's a professional. You know, he almost was in the NBA. And I started Googling you, and I saw you all in Real GM and stuff. And, um, yeah, I I just want to know what brought you here. Like, what was – why London? We're only – we're not that big city. We're, we're okay. I mean, well, yeah, I had the, the team here, right? And um, so what happened was uh, the team from Oklahoma, Michael Ray, he wound up getting the coaching job here, and he pretty much brought up almost the whole team that we had from Oklahoma oh, and brought them here. So I knew all the guys here. At that time, I wound up taking a job in Australia. And um, I was still, I was still, um, you know, communicating, talking back and forth with the guys. And, you know, they were saying that they was interested in having me here. Um, so, you know, I was just still under my contract there. I wasn't going to go and ask to be released or whatnot. I wanted to honor that contract. So, you know, once the season was over with there, and I was just, you know, we came to terms that I wasn't really going to go back and play. In Australia or whatnot, I knew I only had like another two, maybe three years, you know, left in the tank, you know, so I was like, you know, why don't I just try to get back closer to home and just try to have my last, you know. It was a new years. league at the time, so there was a lot of question marks behind it, too, to see where it could go, yeah? Yeah, so I was like, you know, why not just spend these last few years and just, you know, have fun and possibly win another championship along the way. So. And another thing that was kind of cool, that is cool about the MBLC, the National Basketball League of Canada, the former league you played in, um... They have a lot more imports than the average international team compared to everyone else. Every other international team, they only have two imports, correct? Yeah, they have two. It just depends. You have and the London that, Lightning have more, right? Yeah, you have some that can have four, but you can only play them so many minutes, right? Like, so, you know, you have four imports. They can only play. You can only put two on the floor at a time, and they can only play for, like, half the game, right? So it's just so many, you know. Whereas here, you guys can just come and play. Yeah, right? here at first, I think it was, you had to have two Canadians. That so you could, have, yeah, you, know, ten, you could have 10 imports, and then it, it went down to, it went to. All the American athletes were like, oh, yeah, shit, I'm coming up here. <laughs> so I think it's four. It went up to three, and now it's, it's four. four, yeah. It's four, four is the minimum, now. which is fine. Yeah, so I think, Brad, I think eventually, you know, as basketball is kind of more popular in Canada, I think they're going to. Well, this league needs to stay. That's the big thing. I yeah, think. I think what'll happen is, you know, I'm not saying you know this year or next year, but I think another <laughs> few years down the road, it'll probably start being like more of the international markets where you have, you know, two maybe three imports and the rest of the team. Well, what do you think? Year. What do you think the MBLC should do to try and improve itself to take the next step going forward? Like, what do you think is a move they should try to make? in order to keep themselves competitive with other leagues to bring in high-end talent? I think right now it's just being consistent, right? Like, um, you know, you get you something that's working, and of course you want to build on that, but you don't want to start trying to make too many changes. True. You know, you know that's one thing we both know, like, just us as humans, like, we don't really do well with so much changing, right? So you just want to try to just, you know, everything flowing, you want to, you know, find out how to make that machine work, how to order make it work better. But at the same time, you know, find out how to make it evolve too, right? So you want to just, you, you want to, you don't want to keep it exactly the way it is. You want to still add, but you don't want to start pouring too much on it at one time, True. right? Because what happens, and I think when you see leagues that do that, they wind up watering it down real quick. 
Listen, mm. you know, everybody been overwhelmed with the changes. You know, owners wind up, you know, bumping heads. This owner like it. These few owners don't. Well, the, the ones who are making as much money don't like yeah, that so idea. Yeah, so I think what happens is, you, you know, you, you want it to grow, but you don't want to try to, you don't want it to try to grow overnight. Either. So should they try to adopt U.S. dollars for their payroll, for their salary? I think that, I think right that now. That be a smart with, move? Uh, I think right now with the exchange rate, it's kind of tough to say, right? Because with that the exchange tough, rate yeah. right now, you know, Know, with the craziness that's going on in the states right now, the American dollar I think is higher than the Canadian dollar. Oh yeah. So it's kind of hard to get a player over here and say, okay, we'll give you X amount of month, but they got a wife, kids, bills, and stuff at home. So if you're giving them six, seven thousand a month here, which is still a good salary, and then but after, after they get taxed, you know that six or seven drop, and then by the time the conversion rate, that they drop, gotta send it back home to the states. That done drop, you know what I'm saying? They're so, off working at a factory back home, unfortunately. No, not even that. They, they'll probably take a lower market overseas job. Uh -huh. that would, you know that when it all boils down, they're gonna have more money hitting the U.S. account than after the exchange or True. trade in Canada, right? So, I mean, it can go that way. But then what happens when the U.S. dollar is less than the Canadian? You know what I'm saying? Or, Anything with the exchange, because you know that's like the big thing once you get an overseas market is exchange rates, right? So as long as you can start, like you said, if you can start negotiating your contracts and doing them in U.S. dollars, then, you True, know, they it just gotta, matter, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just depends on the owner of the team, right? He's like, okay, uh, am I willing to pay out for the seven thousand? Yeah, right that right. exchange rate. Because the seven thousand, that'll be like ten thousand, yeah, well, almost eleven thousand in Canadian a month, yeah. Think about it. If you had ten thousand Canadian dollars, it'll probably go down to seven, seven thousand five hundred. Just about eight, maybe. Yeah. yeah. True. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be around ten. Yeah. So Fair yeah. enough, I guess. Well, I, I think one thing that definitely helps this league is Royce White being there. Oh, Jasmine, you're Christian now. Um, Royce White coming to this league definitely helps them out because it gives them a little more validity, in my opinion. It gives them uh, a guy who's been to the NBA. I know he had a bit of a problem with his anxiety. And I'm glad he's dealing with it now because obviously you don't want anyone dealing with that problem. And I'm going to be honest, when I was younger, I was a little ignorant to it because you, you see, I was a younger man, and you see, uh, it's hard to, you see Royce White and you go, man, how do you not want to play? I mean, you're in the NBA, you're getting paid millions of dollars, like just suck it up and go on the airplane. But you don't see what he's going through in the, the whole political aspect behind the scenes with him too, right? Yeah, but it's like, it's, it's, it's one of them things where it goes down to like ignorance and bliss, right? Kind of mm -hmm. thing. You know, like, like when I was coming up, my mom always told me, you know, a lie will make it a halfway around the world before the truth make it out the front door. Yeah. And that's the truth, man. Like, when you're in university, especially at a university like that, man, like Royce White was, like, you're not riding a bus to every game. So he flew. Like, the guy flew. Everybody knows that. True. So when it comes to it, it's three different stories, right? It's their story, it's his story, and then it's the truth, right? So that's what it is. So, I mean, I knew it was more to it in theory that uh, he just wouldn't get on an airplane. That's just what like they that. told the media. That's what they tell the media, and that's what the media push. And if you don't, you know what I'm saying, don't try to look at it as, as in the big picture, you'll fall right into that stuff. You know, like, that's what they try to do. Because, you know, no franchise, no organization want to ever come out and say, well, we found out he, he had this condition and we just didn't want to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't, nobody wants to come out and say that, right? So what they're trying to do is trying to make it look like it's that guy's fault. You know what I'm saying? So then it's, it's easier like for that. everyone to just go, hey, why does he want to be in the NBA? I mean, what the hell? That's what it is. All of them. You know, the, the, who was it? The Houston Rockets? Well, the Rockets, the Rockets said this is what it is. This and is what, the this Kings what, and then the Sixers. Yeah, well, this what they said that's what it is. So it has to be true. Like, you, you know, like I say, you don't... You, gotta hear both sides of the story, you know, and that's just one thing we don't really do, you know. Um so um so what happens after you go and you start thinking about retirement? What were some of the things that were coming going through your head? You just start going, Okay, is it just harder to wake up in the morning on game day or what? Yeah, it's actually it wasn't that it's just that, you know, things just wasn't getting as exciting anymore. Um your body you start you start feeling it. It just you know you get in there it takes you a whole lot longer to warm up it's just you know with me it just got to i wasn't as excited about game days and things like that and you know having my son too you know that kind of changed because i was like i didn't want to run my body in the dirt for the next couple of years and then once he get how age, that son changed yeah yeah and once he get of age you know to want to do something i'm just you know knees ankles hips whatever it's just so bombed out where i can't even go out and just you know uh, you can't like, show him, or, yeah, I can't go and do anything with him. So, I mean, 
I was at peace with it. You know, once it was done, it was done. You know, you still sit back and, you know, you see and, you know, kind of lick your chops and be like, you're a lot of it. I know that that's just the thing about it. You know, done something for almost 15 years and you're not going to be two years removed from it and just not think about it and stuff like that, right? So, you still ever get a hankering still or no? Oh, but sometimes you watch and you just be like, oh, like, I'd have done this in that situation. Like, you know, it's just how it is, right? But it's just one of them things, but you've been in those situations, right? So, you know, you can kind of like, you know, kind of mentally clock into that, that specific moment and be like, you know, I like, you know, I, you know, I could have done it like this. It's kind of like the Matrix, right? Like you watch the Matrix, <laughs> and you know how they just put the screen in front of them, and you just see like all the numbers, and that's, that's just, yeah, you know, that's just how it is. Like when you just like that's that's the best way to sum it up. That's how it is when you have somebody that knows basketball versus people that think they know. You know what I'm saying? It's like you know, you seeing just you know, you seeing 94 by 50 hardwood, and I'm seeing like other stuff. But yeah, that's what I'm seeing. So. <laughs> Zeros and ones. Yeah. Wow. Um. So then, what's the game plan for your son, Kellen? Because he's turning three this July? Uh, in June, yeah. In this June, month, right? Yeah, in June. 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 Next, this coming month. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's turning three. Um, a lot of I, I get that. Question well, let's say, lot. let's say, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but so, let's say um, he does like basketball. He wants to go become a professional athlete. Let's say, like, because you're not obviously going to force him. I've heard you say whatever he wants to do, if he wants to paint, if he wants to play soccer, if he wants to play hockey, if he wants to swim, whatever it is, you're going to try and get him to be the best at it. But what's your plan for when he is going to be start becoming an athlete or trying to become a professional athlete? Well, I think the first thing I teach him is that I don't want him to go in with a sense of entitlement. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't just because in, your dad was a professional or, athlete doesn't mean you're going to be Or don't think just because you show up that it's going to be given to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. you're going to go in, you want this, you go in and you work for it. You know what I'm saying? And that's just... You know, you, you you don't see that as much now. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, don't, like, don't go in thinking just because you show up that you're going to get, you know what I'm saying? That's not life. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's true. That's why people don't understand when they say that sports, not even saying basketball, sports in general, it's a teacher of life. You know what I'm saying? And that's what it is. Like, it teaches just because you show up doesn't mean that you couldn't get it. You know, you got to work. Some people are lucky, but it doesn't work. Some people are lucky, but you know, you, you, you look at a lot of these NBA players, you know, a lot of them. Jared Smith, lucky. Yeah, a he, lot he admits of, it. Yeah, a lot of them, you know, they, they, they catch that luck, and then you have some that's told no. Jonathan Simmons, right? No, 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 and then he get that break, and you make the 27 year up. old, yeah. he's like 25, tries out for the D League team, yeah. pays 125 Dang. bucks US dollars. Yeah. Damn. So it's like, that's, that's, so that's basically what I teach him, you know, with that. You know, if it's something that you want, you work, you put in the work for it. Don't, don't think you're just going to come in and I'm going to show up because. I could possibly I'll probably shoot. I can shoot better than this kid, then I'm hands over better kind of thing. You know, like that's just one of those things. So. Well, and you can't ride your coattails because that's not going to work. It doesn't get you that much far. No, it's not. And um, like I, I just wanted to make his own name. You know, like I don't ever want, like I don't ever want this like around here or anywhere else. And the, you know, the stuff on the court they be like, that's you know, that's dope and something. You know what I'm saying? Like, it means his kid, yeah. yeah, like, I don't, you know, it'll happen, you know, because people don't really know him name-wise or whatnot, but I want to make his own name, you know? And that's just, um, you know, like, that's just how it is. And so, let's say you're here 10 years from now, 15 years from now, even. Are you going to stay in London? Because you're trying to become a Canadian citizen. Let's say you become a Canadian citizen, and... Are you staying in London with Kellen? Are you trying to go to Toronto? Like, what's your next move? I mean, I'm pretty, I like it here. You know, dude, you know, just the, the, it's not a crazy class lifestyle. You know, it's not too slow. It's real manageable. So I, you know, I'll be here um, with him. You know, and I foresee if he wants to get into sports like that. I see a lot of traveling for me and his mom in the future. But I mean, it's it's one thing a lot here is you, you neighboring borders, right? So you're not too far from Buffalo, New True. York. Detroit. You're only about an hour and a half, yeah, two hours. Yeah, we could drive to Toronto. He got a tournament or something he can go to. Like, we can drive up and come back down. I'm not too far from Major Hub, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that, you know, that's very cool. But, you know, I would stay here with him or whatnot, you know. And, Quite a little city. I mean, yeah, well, 350,000 people. Yeah, so. Um, so, we're going to bring it back to the MBLC finals. It's um, the Monk, the, the Halifax Riptide. The Raymond. The Raymond, Raymond. The Raymond, sorry. Yeah. Versus the London Lightning. And I believe the series is 1-1. No, Lightning took it last night, so it's 2-1. 2-1. Uh, what was the final score? I think it was 92 to like 106. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, who you got in the series then? Do you think the Lightning will win? Yeah, I think they will. And I mean, 
not saying that just because they're a former team, but just they've been the best team all year, right? I mean, they do a former team. Yeah, I mean, they. I mean, even as a group, right? Like it's just because I mean, you got to think. It's been times when he wasn't there and they won tough games. That's too, true, right? and it is a little ignorant to say they have a former NBA player because if you read some of the articles, they said when he first came in for tryouts, he was raw with a capital R. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's what it is. But they, you know, they've been the best team consistently. You know? True. So, I mean, consistency, you feel like that, that wins, you know, outright. They're a deep squad. They have, like, you know, of course, they have Royce. They have Garrett, who I played with. They have Ryan Anderson, who can shoot the lights. Garrett out. Williamson, yeah. he played in the Orlando Summer League? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I, not think, sure. I can't remember. I yeah, thought I remember. Yeah, they have Ryan Anderson, who was, like, a dead eye at the three. Yeah, you know he's what a saying? good shooter. And he's a good defender, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. You always see on Facebook, like, player of the game, player yeah. of the game. Yeah, you know, you have, um, they have a, a guy, Kyle Johnson. You know, he's a, a, a nice guy. They got Dude and I played against Randy Doug here in June. And they got Marvin Phillips back, too. Marvin Phillips, you know, he, he's still a beast. They have, um, you know, they deep. They, they deep. Yeah, they have a good squad, man. So it's like, you know, they're one of them teams where it's like pick your poison, right? Like, you got you got one game, you know, the guy Royce can give you 30 and 15, and – then yeah, you turn around the next night and Garrett and gave you 30 and, you know, Cal- eight, Cal- and, they, yeah, and then you turn around and you look in the thing like last night and the first game, you know, the one game Ryan has like five, then he comes back the next night and give you like 33. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't, like you can't scout that. That's hard no, to scout. Right. You know what I'm saying? You can't go in and say, okay, well, this is their guy. We're going to shut him down when you have those pieces. So, I mean, how the fact, you know, have those on there, you know, they look like a good squad, but I think in the, the damn line is just, the two deep form. Um, so who do you have? We're going to segue now to the NBA stuff now. We're going to talk a little bit about my favorite team, the Toronto Raptors, in a second. I only love Kyle Lowry's favorite player, fundamentally sound player. Anyways, um, we're going to talk about the upcoming finals. I have the Golden State Warriors winning it in six games, possibly seven. I'm saying six or seven. I think it's Golden State's to lose, in my opinion, because Kevin Durant coming there is just too much, I, I believe, for the Cavaliers. What do you think of it? That's a tough one right there. I think it it's is just, tough. I think it's whoever grabs that momentum and holds on to it. So I, I don't think it's really to say who... It's going to be a little tough having, like, seven days off, a week off, yeah. between you know, I one and the last game. Yeah, I don't see, like, when, you know, people... Saying okay, well you got Steph that shoot, Clay Thompson that shoot, Kevin Durant a score, and Draymond Green. I mean, but you know, in the grand scheme, you got Kyrie, you got Kyrie, you have LeBron, you got Kevin Love, you have you got Tristan Thompson who's a good. He knows what he do. And see, that's what he is fitting his role. Yes. Yeah, people like I, you know, I would take that. You know what I'm saying? I would take. Let's just say, for instance, you have a guy that's averaging, you know, twelve and eight, but you have a guy that's also averaging ten and. 10, but knows what he's doing. He knows his role. Knows his role. I'll take that all day. You get what I'm saying? Like, that guy knows what he does. He's not That's been a professional. There. Yeah, it's, you don't see too much inconsistency in guys like that. Guys that know what they do are the most consistent guys, you know? So, I think it's whoever just grab that momentum and just, like, don't let it go. It's who's going to, you know. Well, and, like, I don't know. You break down the bench. You got Sean Livingston, great solid point guard. No problems with him there. Um, David West and Andre Iguodala, I just I think that's a solid three guys off the bench that can really do you some harm. Yeah, but I, I mean David West, he's not like the David West of old. Or, no, like, he, that's he true. kills he kills them all with like more fundamentals. Like he gets more, someone solid more, plays. Yeah. yeah, solid plays, good passes at the right time, stuff like that. I'm not taking nothing from him. No, but you're not going to get 20 and 10 out of him. You're not going to get that because I mean even when you go to the to the West Main bench, you got Darren Williams, you got Iman Shepard, you got. I'm not Kyle. a fan of a mind shooter. You, you got Kyle Korver. You got, Kyle Korver's not shooting you got, that hard. You got Shannon Fry. Shannon Fry is shooting. So, that, I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> so about, yeah, so pick the your bench, yeah, the bench is like a kind of tip attack. You know what I'm saying? When True. it comes to that, right? So, it's just like... I know, think it's going to come down into LeBron and KD. I think that's where it might be the same. Honestly, I, I, told, I was talking to a guy um, the other day, man. And in this whole series, I'm going to tell you who I think is going to be the X factor. It's going to be Clay Thompson. Really? I think that's the X factor. I, I, I think Kyrie and Steph Curry will probably X each other out. I think Draymond and Kevin Love will pretty much X each other out. Same thing with LeBron and KD. Pretty you got to think yeah. center for center, for Julia, for Tristan Thompson is kind of going to be a uh, so-so thing. I think it's going to come down to that. 
Clay Thompson, J.R. Smith, Clay Thompson, Kyle Cole. Like, I think that's going to be the X factor in it all. I think he's, like, the guy that can really, like, determine that. I'm not going to say if Golden State loses, but he can determine if they get that momentum. He definitely helps like, decide games. Yeah, yeah. Like, decide games. Because, yeah, that's actually not a bad point there. Because who's starting for the Cavs? you got Kyrie and who's in the back? you got J.R. Smith. Smith. Or is it gonna be, yeah, that, that's true. That can be the deciding factor because yeah. – that is the one small weak point, if you want to call it a weak point, for the Cavaliers. That two spot. Like, kind of. Like, and see, usually, like, I mean, a lot of people say they're not a fan of um, LeBron and Shepard, and that's just due to the fact that they're scoring, right? Like, that's when you look at that's that. It's not bad. It's just, I just see how much he makes. I don't know. Maybe it's just the Jew in me, and I just see, I don't know. I see nine and a half million bucks playing for, like, 16, 16 minutes, but then again, the salary cap is up. So, that's, right? so yeah. that's like, if you take that five years ago, that's like a guy making probably That's a lot three, of money, yeah. Like a guy making three million. You know what I'm saying? Like, but you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, what the sure. But I just think he's, he's he's important in this series due to the fact that you can put him out there on, like, a Steph Curry. And he'll and bother, make it yeah. It was like, what, how tall is a bunch of six, seven or something? At least, yeah, he's a big guard. Too. You know what I'm saying? So that, that can make a night tough, you know what I'm saying, for, you know, Steph Curry 6'3". It makes it tough for him to get up from shots that he can get without having to constantly just dance, 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 dance to sleep. But, you know, that takes a lot of pressure off of Kyrie. You know what I'm saying? To, and if you notice, like the last final was what they did, they put him on a on him and it kind of ran a tie. Get True. Down, get down in the stretch and those legs wasn't there. I think that's probably why he wasn't knocking those shots down the fourth that he used to knock down because those legs wasn't there. Yeah, like, yeah. He was having to like work, work, work early in the game for the shots. So, and um, so, yeah, I just think it's just whoever grabs that momentum early and just say, hey, I'm not letting it go. That's who, this is just the NBA. There's a lot of, Great players on the floor, so True, one team, the best one, the best yeah, right. one team can grab the momentum and still potentially lose a game, you know, by a couple points or something. Well, game like one's that. definitely gonna be a toss-up in my opinion. Yeah, it's just I think game one they're both be just filling each other out, right? Because it's a big difference between the regular season and playoffs. Very, you very know, much possessions so. drop, you know, like and you ever notice they're not as many as crazy like high-scoring games, you know. So you have a few of them, but you don't really have that many. Crazy hospital. No, games, no. This, this playoffs, know. though, has been very boring, in my opinion. It's got a lot of blowouts. Like, just blowouts know. where you just see teams not competing after a while. This is where I'm hoping you're going to see if Cleveland, let's say, pulls like a 20 point lead, you're hoping, or I'm hoping, anyways, Golden State Warriors are going to try and, you know, say, fuck this, let's go, let's fight back here, let's make a push, let's do something. I mean, in the finals, you can't. Like, you can't just say, okay, they up 20, we'll do it next time. Well, yeah, you got to make sure you always yeah, dog fight because yeah, you, you do that. You can't just take a game off. Yeah, you can't because, and that's what I was, you know, I was discussing before the guy about the whole Houston thing, right? Like when they came out and they beat the Spurs by like, when they beat the Spurs by like 25 per game, right? But they made 25 threes. I'm like, they're not going to make 25 25 threes. threes Okay, so if you think about it, if you probably go look, Houston will probably make 25 threes, and then they'll probably go a seven, eight game skid where they don't make 25 threes, but they're taking the same amount of shots. Or if they do shoot 25 threes, they're going to have to shoot a lot more threes. Yeah, so you think about it. If, if you make you make 25 threes in game one, the next you know six games, you hurl it up 50 threes, but you're going 13 for 50, 18 for 50. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You're gonna get to you gonna get to high school. Like that's just what's gonna happen because those those threes are not fun. Like if you look at it, they was I seen one play they came down a four on one and Ryan Anderson pulled the trick. I was like, oh, Jeez. like you know, and they, you look at the yeah. thing and they're like 17 for 48 for three, 17. For um, okay, well, quick question. I know it's a little bit old and dated here by now, I guess. Um, did Pachulia make a dirty play? What do you think, Elvin? If I'm, you were shooting in the corner and someone did that to you, what do you say? I mean, I, I feel like what they're saying, man, is you're taught as a, as a player to contest the shot straight up and down or to even go to the side. That's why, if you notice, a lot of players was jumping to the side of people. They'll put their hand up and they'll mm-hmm. do the fly by contest. And then what happened was players started kicking their leg out. Like Reggie Miller. Right. A lot of NBA players start kicking their leg out and then they put that rule in and start putting a stop to that, right? So I think when you contest a shot, they never teach you to contest it going forward. You get a hand up. You're supposed to just be You get a hand, hand up. And it's not too many people that's really jumping to contest a three-point shot anyways. You're talking, you don't really get the chance to never block just, those often. Yeah, you're not going to really block them. So you, you go straight up, you come straight down. Like with him, it was like he was all no, into that sure. guy. So he was all into that guy's cylinder, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta, you got to give him room to come down. 
Yeah. And what I was going to say is cylinder. He's talking about Kawhi Leonard's offensive cylinder yeah. and Pachulia's defensive cylinder, the cylinder around the player in which you're supposed to give them a little bit of space so they can have a, uh, some room to operate and to move. Yeah, so to me, like, to look at it, I think it was good. I think it was good. I think what it are you was, saying to him was, in the tunnel? Are you saying something after the like, hey, man, fuck you kind of thing? Like, in the tunnel, man. Like, it ain't even in the tunnel. Like, in the game, man. It's in the game. Like, you know, like. But Kawhi Leonard's too cool to collect. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's him, but he has teammates, too, right? Oh, yeah. Like, I would, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you you're not going to necessarily get, you know, take it to the point where you get kicked out, but you got to let me know. Like, dude, like, I know, you know, I see the BS that you've done. You know what I'm saying? Like, because you, you look at it, he did the same offense screen. You see how he hit Russell Westbrook. And I mean, I'm like, you know, sorry, but to me, I mean, to see Ennis Canton and them just walk up and help Westbrook off the floor and nobody gets in the man's face. Because nobody like, wants to get fined now. This like, is where I miss old 90s crazy, and 80s man. basketball. Yeah. When you watch little highlights, use an example here. When uh, oh, it was uh, the Kevin McHale hammers, um, who was on the Los Angeles Lakers? I'm Kurt Rambis. Kurt Rambis, that's yeah. it. He just goes and just two hands him on the way up. And that was just a hard foul. That was, just, that was literally the definition of a hard foul back in the day. Yeah. Kurt Rambis gets up all pissed off, and the ref was just like, hey, calm down. And like that, to be honest, I don't think it needs to get that far. But I think there needs to be something where you can kind of go up to the other player, maybe give him a little shove, and say, "Hey, man, what the hell was that? That's not cool." Yeah, but I think when, those days are gone. Like, we'll never True. See yeah. Those. We'll yeah, never yeah. see those days. Like you seen days where it was all like, you know, back in the day, it was all about like this place. But nobody you see Kareem Abdul Jabbar and Larry Bird yeah, ready to go at it. But nobody got kicked out the game. They break it up. Yeah. You, you go to the open and calm down. Maybe you go call to the referee time down. out for a second. And, that's and it. then they get back to playing. Now it's basketball this way. Like, I think the NBA now is so much entertainment, right? Like, it's, 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 it's well, so it much, is an entertainment. It's so game. much entertainment and it's so much, you know, it's, it's more about money or everything. That's why they start to bring up the whole player sitting out thing. I don't agree with it, you know, but hey, if you want to Yeah, I don't agree with that either. You know, because, and I'm not saying that, I mean, I'm saying it in general because it's like, I've seen, I've, I've been fortunate enough to come up during the Jordan era and all, and all of them, so I was And we're back, sorry about that, we had to cut off because there was an interruption. But anyways, we were talking about how the NBA was a business and resting players isn't good for them. Do um, you mind elaborating on where you left off, Alvin? Probably, yeah, like I was saying kind of came along, I was, you know, fortunate enough to come around that time where I was able to see, you know, Shaq and Jordan Barkley, uh, you know, the, the KGs, the Kobe's, every Tim Duncan's and stuff like that. So I see that it's very doable to go year after year after year and, and play every game. And, Carl and Malone. Then, yeah, Carl Malone, Malone and, you know, never really heard like John Stockton, players like that sitting out, right? So it's like, you know, you see it's very doable. And I mean, they did that from, you know, game one to last game. In your opinion, out of 82 games, what's an ex- okay? So rest is inevitable now. Yeah. In your opinion, out of 82 games, what's an acceptable amount of games to rest? I don't really think it's to rest. I think you have to like determine, hey, am I going to cut players' minutes down? You know, like it's it's like you know maybe it's just different parts of the business when they get to that level. That I well, let's use know, an example. Just, let's say, um, sorry to interrupt again, but uh, let's say. You're the Spurs. You got Kawhi Leonard playing. You're about to play the Nets. The Nets aren't very good, obviously, this past year. And Kawhi Leonard averages, let's say, 33 minutes a night. Yeah. Why not just play him 20 minutes? Yeah, why not? That's what I'm saying. Cut the minutes. Like don't a just, preseason game. Yeah, don't, don't have him on the bench in street clothes, but not even have him come to that game. You get what I'm saying? Like, like have him start. Have him start and see where it goes. Yeah, like, play a couple start, minutes and go. Play a few, you know what I'm saying? Cut him down. Try to put him on about five minutes a quarter. Six minutes a quarter, half a quarter, something like that. You know, you, you cut the minutes, but or don't like, have them play the complete second quarter yeah, kind of thing. What I'm saying, like, but what you're seeing now is you have a player like just um, they're not injured. Not Brooke Lopez, and I think Brooke sitting. Lopez and Dwight Howard in the first five games this past season rested a game. Yeah, like you know, you have that, and it's like they're on the bench in street clothes, not injured, they're just um, resting and like or not even showing up to arenas. So, like, not even going to that's not cool. Like, you know, I mean, like you said, at the end of the day, you have people that pay their money to see Especially these players. Especially if you say courtside. You know, like, you got to think about it. In, in theory, if you go to watch, like we just said, the Spurs, right? Like, if you go to watch the Spurs, right? You know, no knock to the Spurs, but nobody's going to watch Patty Mills. 
you know, know nobody I get this nobody's going to you know the hardcore fans maybe but I see yeah what you're but you know they go they want to see Kavana you know what I'm saying you go see the Cavs or whatnot or you want to see Tony Parker yeah you're not yeah yeah, yeah you yeah you want to go see them you're not going to you know you go to the Cavs or whatnot you're not going to see you know you want to go and see the big three playing at the same time you get what I'm saying like that's just what it is you go to OKC game you're not going to you know and it's Kendra yeah yeah, yeah you're not going you want to go see what you know Westbrook so that's what it is I mean so I think a, I think a little something is better than nothing in that situation so I mean even if you say okay you know because like, if you rest my player now obviously you're saying this game should be a breeze my bench my role players or whatever they should be able to take care of this I mean you still suit the player up let him go out you know get him a few reps in and stuff like that you limit the minutes but you don't just say okay like you know what we're gonna you know like they did that in with Cleveland, right? You know, we're going on the road. You know, you just stay back home. You know, yeah, so it's, yeah, a one, yeah. it's a one game trip. You just stay back here and rest. You know, we're going like, like you don't do that. You know, like, but that's just that's that's nature. That's the nature of things, right? You know, you get away with it one way. Somebody's going to constantly push, constantly push, constantly push until it starts getting out of control. And then you got to put everything on lockdown. You get what I'm saying? And that's just, that's why I see it going. Fair enough. Um. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that they should play like a preseason game. They need to try to just play them around 20 minutes tops, you know, five minutes a quarter, perfectly fine, and go from there. Or have them not even play, have them play the first quarter for a bit, don't play the second quarter at all, and then halfway through the third, put them in then, and then close out the game for you. I think that could be a little more strategic, too, to be honest with you, but what can you do? Uh, so we're going to move on to now some free agency stuff, some grumbling, some grumbling, see what happens with that. So Chris Paul to the Spurs. What do you think about Chris Paul to the Spurs? That's an oh, interesting man. one. I think that's, I think from a basketball standpoint, that's a win-win. Overall best point guard in the NBA, would you say Chris Paul? Uh, the, oh, I say he's the Without overall age. traditional point guard. Yeah. Like, you know, because Chris Paul, he can, like, people, they get caught up, like, Chris Paul can score the ball. He can score the ball, yeah. he can pass the shit out of the ball, but he can also, like, he can also control the game. You get what I'm saying? Like, he can take, take a game over. He can through. take a game and he can, like, you know, impose his will many different ways on it. You know what I'm saying? He can dictate the tempo of it. He can, you know, you want to get up and down, he can get up and down. If you want to slow up and play in the half, he can get people shots in the half, you know, and create his own shot. So that's why I say I think it was pop system. I think that's that a, I think that would be a good fit. Oh yeah, I think he'll be he's having, like 31, 32. Yeah, I think he'll be because if you like, you can't take it. Like I, don't, I just don't want to see him go somewhere where they want him to just flop it down the court and just be the super. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, he's getting just knowing what yeah. just knowing what we know now, seeing the the progression and the regression of athletes. Once they get over thirty, it's just inevitable. I know LeBron James is a very rare, rare case of what's happening right now. But they're always going to lose a bit of a step. You always yeah, do. I think, but I think well, that's that's the advantage that I think Chris Paul has. Like, he doesn't um, play too explosive. He doesn't play like you know, you know no crazy explosive. He just good footwork. He's sound, yeah. Moving. He's sound. You know, he he know how to create his shot and he knocks it down. But you know, that's why I say like that's what's going to like it's it's a lot of players in the league. Like once they hit that hump, it's going to be interesting to see how they adjust. To it's it, separate right? like, You know, yeah. what I'm saying like that's like like Westbrook. Like I love like. Like his heart, love his motor, he got you know. But it's, how many it's years? Just, how many left? years he's gonna be able to play that that crazy aggressive like? Because even if you watch, even with Jordan, when he was in the league, like his first. You Once know, he got over thirty, he started working he, on post moves. He started like that's when he came back with that fadeaway, and he just yeah. been able to you know take it in the half court. And he, he started was, working on his footwork a yeah, lot. Footwork, and he was hitting people with you know two dribble pull ups, a dribble pull up, you know, dribble turn around shot fake. You know what I'm saying like. Starting he, off in the he, mid post, yeah, high post, post too. Yeah, he just, you know, he cut it down. That's why, that's why I say it'd be an answer. But with Chris Paul and the Spurs, I think that I think he wins and they win in that situation, right? Because he'll go somewhere where they understand him and they appreciate, will thoroughly appreciate what he brings to the table. He's he going to make the team better. And Tony Parker. Yeah, he's going to make the team better. Like he's going to make the team. Like if they get Chris Paul, they automatically become a better team, right? And that's competitive yeah, team too. Yeah, competitive team. Two players that they put them with, you know what I'm saying? You put them with Kawhi Leonard, and then you turn around and you put Marcus Aldridge. Because what you do is you take Kawhi Leonard off the ball, and now he can get them. He can get six to eight easy points a night, you know what I'm saying? Where he don't have to work so hard to create, he can just catch and shoot, or, you know what I'm saying? Well, in the Marcus Aldridge, he, he has a lot more skill set on the offensive end. 
maybe not as good defensively as DeAndre Jordan, but I think he can kind of make up with that as a better team defense with Kawhi Leonard being there too. Yeah, right? I think, and I think Chris Paul is the type of guy like you know just watching him over the years, even with the with the Clippers or whatnot. Like he's not gonna let the walkers on the cell. You know what I'm saying? He's you got smart. Yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah, you got a mismatch. We're gonna go to you on this block. If you pick, you he's pop, I'm gonna hit you too. I want you to knock this shot down, kind of thing. You know so. You know, I, like I said, it's a win. To me, that's a win, a win, a baby. Chris Paul, like, you know, and Tony Parker, like, holy crap. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, Jeez. And, and Chris Paul, man, if he stayed with him, he better play in that system and he's 40. To be honest <laughs> with you, right? Yeah. Like, literally, the way he played, right? Like, is it not like... Um, yeah. So my next question is, it's, we're going to talk about your favorite team in the whole NBA, Elvin, the Toronto Raptors. You love them so yeah. much. They got your boy Kyle Lowry. I know, I know. Everyone in Toronto and Canada wants to know what offer do you make for Kyle Lowry? Because I'll tell you what mine is. I'll go first, and you can tell me what yours is and what you think of my offer. I think, personally, I think we should move on. And I'll go into a little discussion and furthermore on that and elaborate what my real feelings are on that. But I feel we should, out of respect, offer Kyle Lowry the five year deal, but the first two are going to be $20 million apiece. And then the remaining three are going to be 15 apiece. That's what I would offer him. If he doesn't like it, he, this is how I break it down to him in the negotiations. I'd say, if you don't like it, quite frankly, you can go be one of those NBA players who just helps franchises transition and go be a transition athlete. Because I, we want you to step up in the playoffs. <laughs> you just can't. So we're going to have to try and find some help for you on that end. And we want to try and keep Serge Ibaka. I think Serge Ibaka is a top, more priority than bringing Kyle Lowry back because of what you can bring with them. And I think they should let uh, Kyle Lowry go. I think uh, they should keep Patrick Patterson at the right price. I know you don't like him so much, but I think if you put Patterson and Ibaka at the five and the four and get rid of Valanciunas and see what you can get for him, I think that could be a better, more competitive and stronger team. What do you think? Um, I agree with you with the finish upon it, just part ways with Kyle Lowry. I think they should offer him a, a contract out of respect. I think he's yeah. done a lot for this franchise, don't get me wrong, but don't forget, to put into perspective, I'm a really big Raptors fan. I'm such a big Raptors fan. I thought Jose Calderon, when he was playing with us, was a top five point guard. Back, you would have said that ten years ago. I would have went to the death on that one. I'm not even joking. I can see Alvin. You guys don't. We don't have video, but you should see Alvin's face right now. He's going. He's already questioning my basketball knowledge just by saying that right there. I mean, and that's with me. Like I, I, I think with the basketball thing, like I've always broken down. Right. I mean, you got 30, 30 teams in the NBA. Thirty right? teams. And you have twenty nine of them in the states. You have one in Canada. <laughs> right, so you, you think about it though. Like you're gonna have a big market. I, I was I was watching TV. I think they said they're like the third largest market in the NBA. Well, here's right? the problem with the Raptors. The CRTC doesn't, and the CRTC and whoever the uh, the one who controls all the ratings for the American side is. They don't like to work together for some reasons. Meaning, so if you look on paper, technically the Raptors are the last rated franchise in the NBA. They make the worst ratings on paper because they don't account for them in the States. And then who's going to watch Raptor games in the States, let's yeah. be honest. Um, if they actually did, the Raptors would be sixth, I believe, top ten franchise just on how much they get exposure here in Canada. But they don't really see it and recognize it for some silly reason. So, I mean, you have that. So, I mean, that's that's like working on a lot of the player side. But, yeah, I think it's just part ways with, with, with um, Lowry. And just, you know, honestly, me, I mean, you got a point like it came through Fox system, won a championship. Well, you got Corey Joseph right there. Like, I just put the ball in his I'm hands. I'm a huge fan. Like, I would just put the, I would put the ball in Corey Joseph's hands and be like, look. Like he can, he's shown that he can knock down shots. He's and here's the thing. I know people are saying, oh, but Kyle Lowry averaged 20 points. We're losing 20 points. Here's the thing. I would rather take Corey Joseph's consistent 10 to 12 points a game, seven assists a game, and being a solid point guard. And I think we should bring in a guy like Jameer Nelson and let DeLon Wright thrive and try to be the backup point guard. And him and Jameer Nelson can do it by committee during the regular season. And then when you need a vet, you have a guy like Jameer Nelson or a guy like Mario Chalmers who, who you have – to try and slow the pace down when you need it. And Corey Joseph knows what to do, too. He has a championship. He's been in big games. I know you see the offensive drop a bit, but I think us losing 20 points a game from Kyle Lowry isn't as big of a deal that we think because we were a good team with him. Don't, like, we were a great franchise. I'm happy where the Raptors are now, but I think it's time for us to take the next step and build solely around DeRozan and try to make him our focal point 
and make Ibaka another focal point too, because Ibaka is a pretty good offensive player. He's not a slouch like when he first came into the league. He couldn't hit anything outside of the key. Yeah, I mean, he's, and he's good on both ends too. Like, he act, uh, he's an actual threat for us okay. in the paint. We exactly. haven't had that since. Exactly. So I, you, you can put him, Antonio Davis. Yeah, so yes. you can put him on a five. You can put him on a four. You know what I'm saying? And he's he's gonna put in work on both ends. Like you got that. I, P.J. Tucker, I would keep him. Oh, yes, yeah, 100%. Like, you got 100%. Demari Carroll needs to go, but don't yeah, get that. Him and, and DeRozan. You know, those, those are the guys. Like, and I mean, I stand corrected. Like, if I'm wrong, I'll say I'm wrong. And, I mean, I've told you before, even like the past, like, like a couple of years ago, I remember telling you, like, I wouldn't build a team. When Washington and Toronto were playing. Yeah, yeah, I was like, you know what, like, I don't really see DeRozan. He was laughing at people. Yeah, I don't really see DeRozan being a player I would build a team around. Like he's a good rob into a Batman. Like that's that's literally my words or whatnot. But I'll take that back. You know what I'm saying? Like the dude proved I mean, he's like you can literally build a team he can around get him. your bucket. Yeah, with the right people. You know what I'm saying? But Larry, I, I, I'm sorry. We should have never let James Johnson go. God I, damn, that's no, gonna be an underlying theme I, to this I, podcast. I've been We're gonna get a James that. Johnson jersey from the Miami Heat too. I've been saying that. I've always said, why is that dude sitting on the bench and not playing? Elvin, Elvin's been saying that since we brought him in. When El- <laughs> when he brought him in, Elvin said, hey, you guys made a smart move. You know, you got, we got brought in James Johnson. You know, he's solid professional. He's a six yeah. nine, big guy. He can play the three, the four. Is not gonna, you know, get you thirty points, but he can play good defense. Can push the ball up the court and actually make a move and make a play. And if he's at the four, he's kind of like a poor man's Draymond Green, and that's not a bad comparison. I think. Yeah, and that's, it was like, you know, and I think what was unfair to that guy was when y'all was playing Cleveland last year. He sits there, tie series, and, even, then, and then all of a sudden you throw him out there and say, "Stop LeBron." Like, oh yeah, you haven't played all playoffs. Okay, man, now you use your chance. We'll stop LeBron. Yeah, you we got you for that. Now. You know what I'm saying? Like I would take him. I'm sorry, I would take him over Patrick Patterson. I would take him over Jamari Carroll. <laughs> you can take. He can knock down a three. He's shown that he doesn't live and die by it. He can knock and it that's out. where the Raptors, the he Raptors, can, in my opinion, love to go and say, oh, everyone shoots threes, now let's shoot threes, yeah. instead of making their own identity. Yeah, you have that. You know, he can grab a rebound and push the ball. He is a good He's like a point forward. Yeah. yeah, he can facilitate the offense. He can pass the ball well. I mean, and if you look at it with Patrick Patterson, man, yeah, he's in the NBA, so that says he's a great player. But still, like, he picks, he pops. He catch it, he don't have the shot. He dribbles, he pass it off. He picks, he pops. Like, if he's not knocking that down, you're not getting too much from him. Aside of those little fluky little runners in the paint here and there, but you're not getting nothing from him. At least Jay Johnson can break somebody down off the dribble. He can do a little pump. Defense, defense, yeah, defense commit. He can pass the ball. Huh? And he knows where to pass the ball. Exactly, man. But you know, they was not playing the guy. And then all of a sudden, he goes down to Miami. Mark Carroll should have never left the Atlanta Hawks. That was a perfect system. Nah, I'm not going to even say he shouldn't have left the Atlanta Hawks. Y'all should have just never signed him. Not for that. Well, when Jay Crowder's making the seven and a half million bucks and we're paying Demari Carroll 14. And here's the thing. You're going to hear me shit on Demari Carroll. I'm sure he's a nice guy. I bet you he pays his taxes, and I bet you he bought his mom a fucking nice house. But here's the thing for me. We pay him $14.5 bucks to do what exactly? What has he done this year? And it, Here's another underlining theme that's going to come back in this podcast, too, because I got a lot of problems with the Raptors, and I love them, too. But we never should have let Rudy Gay go. And I know people are saying, why, why Rudy Gay stay? He should have he stayed. He's a crappy player. People need to realize the only player left from the Rudy Gay trade from Sacramento is Patrick Patterson. Nothing else has come from that trade, meaning we should have kept Rudy Gay. He's a more legit threat than Patrick Patterson, in my opinion. He's a better player. We brought in Grievous Vasquez and Patrick Patterson. They were great for us at the time to get us to the playoffs with Brooklyn because we needed a solid bench. But, yeah. Yeah, but this is like, it's, like I said, it goes back to having an entire country behind him, a franchise. That's just how it is, though, right? Like, it's like, you know, in the States, we're like brutal sports fans. Like, like, we don't care. Like, you must want to make it to the playoffs three years in a row and get cool. knocked out at the same spot. Pretty soon, we're going to be like, man, like, the boss is like, you got to make the fast. Like, if you're not making it further than that, man, we just like, man, you trash. Like, we're like, we say that at the beginning of the season. I'm yeah. just going to make it to the second round and tank. Like, that's what we say. So, ain't nobody, mm-hmm. you know, but here it's like, and I think, like, honestly, it's now seeing it. I see that frustration starting to happen here with people in the Raptors. They like, yo, like, let's start doing something. Yeah, we, we gotta start doing. It. We can't just keep getting to the because the the, the the NBA thing is that the East is watered down, right? So if you're somewhat of a strong team, you're gonna make it into the playoffs. You, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, but then once you get to them teams that you gotta compete, like you can't just be well, like. Well, you would you always know. say this too. You'd say. The Raptors will go play a tough game against Cleveland in the regular season, maybe win by five or lose by five, 
or play the Spurs and win by five, lose by five, and then they'll go play like the Phoenix Suns and lose by 15. Yeah, and like, it's like, you it. can't have that. They play like the number three team or the number four team in the East. And playing well. And, and play well and beat them by like 10 points, 15. But then they'll turn around and go play like a number 12 seed team in the West and get beat by 20. And barely, can, yeah, barely can keep up. It. Like it's, it's like, at what point does all that change? But like I said, man, yeah, so I'm, I'm like, you know what? Laura, it was a good one here. We appreciate everything you got. You know, save some money. You already got Corey Joseph inked for, what, three years? At seven two more years. years. Two, two more, more years. You got him inked in there for two more years. Why not? Why not try to bring in the DeLon Wright looks like he'd be okay. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of six five point guards. Those just are my big fans. Uh, just try to go find you another, you know, mid-level kind of vet point guard to bring in. Mario Chalmers, Jameer Nelson. And then our, our head coach should be Kevin McHale. And I think um, Jerry Stackhouse should be brought up as an associate head coach. And what they should do is talk to Kevin McHale, sit him down on the interview, because now I'm running the Raptors in my perfect scenario. <laughs> and I'm sitting down Kevin McHale, and I'm going, hey, uh, you're pretty tall, first off. Second off, um, you're going to run the franchise for three years. You're going to groom Jerry Stackhouse. And if you do that right, you're going to get yourself a GM job. You're gonna, you'll be under me if I'm beside you, Jerry. And the, de- the Raptors do need a GM because the Orlando Magic just hired our president of basketball operations who basically was our gm essentially so what you could do is give kevin McHale that title and the coach so we can have some say on what guys need to get brought in um i think he should be in the league i think he should be a coach i don't understand why he's not he's a hall of famer arguably top 15 power forward of all time then there's a lot of five top there you go he's the top five and he was he was no slouch and if anyone's wondering who the heck kevin McHale is please google him I'm a bit of a basketball historian, so you got to know some of these names I'm going to throw at you. Yeah. Um, that's my opinion. I think the Raptors need to bring in Kevin McHale, and I think they need to do that with them. I love the Raptors, but here's one of the problems, and Alvin, you helped me realize it. When you hang around the Raptors long enough, you're going to be top five in something, meaning our leading scorer is DeMar DeRozan. Next is Chris Bosh, Vince Carter. Pretty good guys right there. Chris Bosch, if everything went all, if everything went right, I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer player right now, but if everything went and kept playing the way he was going and he kept doing what he was doing, I think he would have been a Hall of Famer, given that he would have been around 20,000 points plus, and he would have been around uh, almost 10,000 rebounds, and he had two championships. That, that, that alone right there, plus 10 years of being an All-Star and being on an All-NBA team, that's enough, in my opinion, to get a resume. If Mitch Richmond can get in on that, on his resume, and not making it to the Western Conference Finals, Chris Bosch has got two rings. Anyways, after those three, it falls off to Andrea Bargnani. I'm going to say that one more time. Andrea <laughs> Bargnani, whom we should have had LaMarcus Aldridge. Cool. And then Morris Peterson, whom I love so much. But, uh, Morris Peterson. Yeah. He's a good guy. You put him in any of the franchise, he's just a, he's a nice guy. Yeah, I think mean, Morris Peterson. Did what they brought him there to do. And he was a professional, yes. Yeah, he, like, he, like, I, I have him when he was around because I like him. I, I liked him a lot, too. When he was averaging 16 points a game, I thought he was a great – he, he was averaging 16 points a game on good shooting, too. He's okay. a smart guy. So you think about it now. You take from now, I mean back then to now. You let him average 16 points a game. How much do you think his contract will be? Oh, God. Exactly. So that, that shows you right there, right? So now, if you look at Bariani, do you see, do you see them giving him – I like how you didn't even say his name right. Yeah, what is it? Bariani? Bariani. Like, you look, you look at him now, right? Like, they would, he would be like a lower paid player, man. Right? It's just, that's but how we just fell in love with him, and Brian Clangelo was, was he, he'd be damned. He's going to make sure I mean, he's going to And it's the same thing now, man. Like I say, though, I'm sorry. Like, you, know, you have people, it's, at the end of the day, it's a business, right? Like, and I've heard coaches, I've heard the GM say, you know what, like, he's a good guy, but we have to make this move. You know what I'm saying? Mama house in a car. He's that's, just, that's what it is, man. And it's, that's the same thing. Like, I don't know why they're hanging on to that Bruno Caboclo. I don't know. <sighs> the, um, oh, the no. Nagara. I don't know why, like, those Oh, it's because Nagara and Caboclo are best buds. That's like, why. He, like, I don't know why they're hanging on to him. Like, this dude, Jakar Sampson. This if he's ever listening to this, Jakar Sampson, you should be in the in the NBA, and you should be playing for the Toronto Raptors as an up-and-coming small forward. You're 6'9", 220 pounds, and you're a hell of an athlete, in my opinion. Yeah, like, I don't see why they, like, they, you know, they just, they stuck on that. Like, this dude was your first-round pick in 2014, and he's has and more games. had him scouted he has, he, has, yeah, he has more games logged in in the B-League than in the NBA. Norman Powell was the same draft year, and he was a second-round pick. Yeah, and yeah. I remember I was talking to you about this last year. Last year, the Raptors played the Brooklyn Nets. 
and Bruno Caboclo started, and so did Norman Powell. Yeah. Norman Powell had 37 points, like eight rebounds and four assists or something like that. A really strong, solid game. Bruno Caboclo, I remember this one for a fact. He was one for nine with one three-pointer made, yeah. and it was one for nine three-pointers. Yeah. He shot nine three-pointers and made one of them. God damn, man, you gotta make a move. <laughs> yeah, you gotta find yeah, some points you really gotta cut some time. At what man. point, like at one for five, you start going, man, I think I need to just take one dribble in and take yeah, a fucking jump shot. Do something, man. It's just like because I mean to even look at Norman Powell game from last year's edition, you can see the work that he put in. He's bigger and stronger. That's too. from last year's edition. So like, how can you be drafting in 2014? Because he was four and years from being four years away. Alvin. But I'm just so like, I, mean, like, like I wish that, like, one thing, I wish that it's not with these comparisons on just the Brazilian Kevin Durant. Like, no. I don't know what the hell that means. What is he? Like, no. a Kia to no. Yeah, Jesus. no, it's no, it, it ain't no, I'm sorry. It's, it's, you tell me what other player you see. I got a theory, to Alvin. I think Masai Ujiri went down to Brazil when he was about 25 or so, <laughs> had himself a fun time with a sweet Latina piece, and then, lo and behold, a couple years later, someone showed up with some papers and said, uh, yo, I'm calling this one in. Uh, this is your son, and guess what? Now he's an NBA athlete. I don't understand why the hell is he did. When you like when watching him get drafted, I the silence in the room spoke so much volumes on his draft day. I kind of was everyone was like, what the hell is going on? And then you see his game footage. Elvin, his game footage from what they were showing was from a Sony Handycam, and he got drafted like three years ago, four years ago. So I used a Sony Handycam in 2007, 2008 when I was in grade 11, grade 10 area. <laughs> like, what the hell? And everyone's watching the footage going, what the hell? I'm watching like a men's league right now. What yeah, the hell is this? this is there was more footage of him in a tryout than there was in the draft footage. Like, yeah. Oh, and this is like, I don't know. I think people just always trying to find that diamond in the rough when it comes to that, right? And I think he was a real diamond in some rough there. Yeah, because, I mean, if you, if you think about it, you look at Christoph Pazingas, right? Like, I mean... When That's he got though, when right? he got drafted, they booed the shit out of him. Like they was, I mean, New York is a hard work. Yeah, but they <laughs> like they expect him. Like they, you draft somebody, if they name is other than if you, they, even they if they drafted like, Carmelo Anthony, he might have got booed. Yeah, like, they serious. don't, they don't, especially when he was coming out with LeBron, right? Like if you ain't that that sure for my like number one pick, then they're gonna they pretty care. much boo you. <laughs> like, yeah, Jordan, boo. But I'm just saying though, man. I mean, they drafted the dude. He comes out, he did his thing, like. They just say, hey, this guy's a seven three. He can put the ball on the court. He can shoot the three. He can this and that. And would you say and the Latvian uh, professional league is a little bit better than the Brazilian professional uh, league? Because that's where he's playing. Like I wouldn't say. I would, it's hard to say. I've never played in either. I haven't really like researched either. But true. I mean, shit, dude. Like what? Brazilian is seven three. Bruno Caboclo is like six nine. Yeah. Like, dude, like six nine. I don't think that's too far fetched to say. Hey, you should be. Create a shot. You should be because even I would. Rebounds, I mean, yeah. they show quite a few of the beat league games on TV here. Mm. And the Raptor was right. Yeah, and you would and you would see him in some of those games, and he kind of disappears. You just be like, uh, not in a good way. Yeah, you just like, ah, uh, you know, like, it, like you would have that. What's his name? That's Pascal. So Pascal yeah. Siakam. Yeah, Siakam or not. Like when he went down, he was putting up like better numbers. You know what I'm yeah, saying? True, true. Like, so I'm just like, hey, like, well, that's that, yeah, like that's where I started question because you start going i remember you talking to me about this you were saying if you were in the nba no matter what level you know lower level player maximum level player first thing you do when you're in the off season is contact kobe bryant contact uh, akeem olajuwon well kobe bryant now because he's retired tim duncan for instance but like contacting old vets and saying hey like akeem olajuwon who runs camp this is why i fell in love with rudy gay rudy gay uh spent a summer with akeem olajuwon same with kobe bryant and you might think, okay, well, why is a small forward hanging out with uh, Kim Olajuwon wearing post moves? Because Rudy Gay wants to play when he's 35 to 38. Yeah, he wants yeah. and, and still be, not get 20 points a game, but still get 10 points a game. Like Vince Carter, for instance, fall from grace like Vince Carter has. Vince Carter has had the perfect career for uh, being the highest of highs to not really even a low. He's kind of come down perfect. Yeah. And I think the Raptors need to bring him back full yeah. circle. His comeback yeah. is expected, right? right? That's the thing with Vince Carter, right? This, this, he's come back to this back. But, you know, back to what you were saying, like, I don't I don't, I don't, see how you have all those resources available and you don't exhaust them. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, they, they, they would have to tell me to quit calling. I'm sorry. Seriously. Like, yo, like, don't call me. Change the numbers. Yeah, huh? something <laughs> like, this, that's just how it is. Man. That's, that's almost like you you saying, you know what, I want to get into, into, into you know, electronic computers and stuff like that. 
and you you right in your phone you got Bill Gates number, you got Steve Jobs or whatnot. But she's like, you know what? I'm gonna just sit here and just figure I'll this figure shit it out. out. Yeah, like you know I'll what I'm saying? Right. Like why not? You know what I'm saying? Like you can pick the phone up. That's why I like when I see your bigs, like I say before the back injury, I would say Dwight Howard. The reason he was the most he was the most dominant big because he would get the ball on the post, sweep through, bump somebody, dunk it, run the floor, and dunk it. He was the best of them. Yeah, he can. He didn't really have that left and right the jump hook. Played him too, they but tore he, their ass yeah, up. he was going to the paint strong, right? So now it's like, you know, you have the the, the DeAndre Jordans and stuff that you have to literally constantly create shots for. It has to it be that not lob. lob or high pick and roll, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, dude, like they like, oh, he's the he's the high, he's shooting the high percentage. I'm like, well, dude, like when he's he going, us five feet. yeah, when he's going, you know, nine for eleven from the floor and eight of them are dunks, like yeah. that's you, easy to guard. Yeah, dude, you got Chris Paul, he's breaking the defense down. Blake Griffin, because right what you do on that pick and roll is, is you don't tell the guy to hedge, right? You tell him to just stick with DeAndre and yeah. just bump back. And this is just like, but I'm like, dude. You, Someone from Texas. I know he went to school in Texas Tech. Yep. Dude, there's no way you can tell me you can't pick up the phone, call the came Elijah one, and go and start working on post work. Seriously, yeah. You get what I'm point. saying? Like, it's, it's like, how can you not say, you know what? Like, you know, because at what you got to think now, he's what, 26, 27 now? John DeJordan Jordan around there. Okay, 26, 27. That. I'm gonna take that that running the floor like a deer and catch a lobs and stuff. He's, Tyson Chandler had he's, had to adapt. Yeah, it's gonna take about a good this another he probably got about another probably about thirty two. And then you're gonna start seeing something. Happen. Now he's gonna have to turn around and start like legit get on the block, nice post hook, you know what I'm saying? Nice up and on the move. But because now what happens if you look at it like if you look at all the players when they first started with, with Jordan. Kobe, it's the Shacks and stuff. When they would play, they was pewing up and down the floor, up and down the floor. But then they could also kill you in the half court. And then what happens is they went so much from the other half of, you know, the 94 feet to the important half of the 94 feet. And that's mm-hmm. where they capitalized on being more effective. And like they say, man, like, the older you get, <laughs> the further your game get away from the basket. Uh, you get what I'm saying? So that's why it's like, you know, back then they was going through people dunking this and that stuff to, you know, let's get around the fade away. And if you ever notice, like at the end of Kobe's career, he was shooting a lot of jumps. Oh, yeah, yeah, for a lot of mid range. Same thing with like Dwayne Wade. No, Dwayne Wade was more of a slasher, getting to the paint, you know, stuff. Now he's dunking on you every time. Yeah, this yeah. game. And now you're starting to see it happen with LeBron. He's just physically stronger than everybody. So he can, like, he being in a hyperbaric chamber 90 yeah. minutes a day definitely helps. He too, can boom, sure. boom, 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 and get to the paint still. But you notice he takes a lot more jump shots and stuff, too, right? Like, it's just, that's how it he is. He gets smarter, too. Yeah, yeah, so if you don't have like that, why do you think, honestly, why do you think, do you think if Dirk didn't have a jump shot, he would have been in the league as long as he is? Hell no. You get what I'm saying? Even Tim Duncan was still Even Dirk at his best wasn't a strong rebounder. Yeah, so you, you, yeah you look at Tim Duncan. He still he could give you like post work, but he still step out, place you up off the glass. Tim Duncan last year was the fifth best defensive center in the NBA <laughs> at almost 40 years yeah, old. Yeah, so it's like it's just like man, it's just it's, it's, it's the game now is just a special, right? Like, yeah. You know, if you can come down and you can you can hit five out of ten trays, that's in him. You know what I'm saying? Like that's oh you can come off. You get a great workout. Yeah. yeah, that's in this. And just starting to see it happen, man. It's just like they get them right away. So. <sighs> well, and what's your so? What's your stance on? We're gonna switch this thing up here. What's your stance on the big three coming up? The big three with the three on three league with the older guys. What are you expecting out of that? I, I like it. He's got a big like, smile on his face. Yeah, I like it though, man. It's just, it just you know it gives them a chance to. Because some of them, well, I'm gonna say a lot of them are still. Just they not can, that the if, high, if, high level. Yeah, like, that's a different level. Like Kenyon Martin, yeah, for instance. Like they can play, but he's not going to. Kenyon Martin's not going to go out there and run up and down the floor with a Draymond Green. You know, like. Not going to do it for 30 like, minutes. Yeah, you're not going to do that. Man. Like, hey, you mess around and you get into that game. And all it takes is a good media time out the knees and stuff stepping up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for real, man. It's just like, for real. So, like, was, yeah, <laughs> like, you must run during the timeout. You look at he out there doing jumping jacks. Don't expect a lot of timeouts in the big three games. Yeah, so it's like, the, you know, but, yeah, like, the big three, like, a lot of them can still play. It just gives them a chance to all get together and just, you know, just compete. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that, you know, that's, I think it's a good thing. 
You uh, said you played with a, a guy who plays in the league named Mucci Norris, yeah, I former NBA league. player. Yeah, good dude. I see he's he's playing in it too. Yeah. He's playing with the team of league. Yeah, I seen him. He's playing in it right now. But yeah, like it, it, with, when he was playing with me at the time, he had to be you know mid thirties. Cause he's like forty eight now. Mucci? Yeah, nah, he's not forty eight. You gotta think, George is like fifty three. Mucci Norris got he's gonna Something be like, like he's gonna be like forty. I remember now, man. he well, probably forty because yeah. One time, I'm going to do the Google quick. Nah, I mean, he said, 48. Put your new one out. Sorry, I don't want to put your new one on blast like that. But nah, but um, even when he... Big old fro on this thing. Yeah, even when he played with us, I mean, like, you could see it. It's 43. Yeah, it was yeah. my bad. Even you could see it, man. Like, he could, like, he could, like, he could play. You know what I'm saying? And if you put him in, even in, like, Dan, in the CBA or whatnot, when he played with us, he was still, like, it was like he, he was, was playing. Sorry, the Knicks, the Rockets... The New Orleans, Oklahoma City, Thunder, Hornets. Yeah, it was like he was just, he was like a man amongst boys then. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, he was on the back end of it, wasn't it? You know, like 43. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Moose, if you listen to this, Moose, he's trying to make you, he's trying, he trying to say we need to get your AARP card. <laughs> Wait for the senior <laughs> discount. <laughs> um. So yeah, that'd be cool. I think I think it's a great idea. They're also saying for the big three, they don't want um, they don't want people to think this is a league where players are going to try and come back. For instance, like let's say Kenyon Martin kills and has a really good season, you like, you're, right. you're, you're not going to see him trying to go. And I see, I see. Honestly, I'm gonna tell you what I, I see happen. I see uh, some NBA teams seeing them guys and be like, hey, like we can get a Maybe. good 15 minutes Maybe. out of them, yeah. you know what I'm saying, and, and try to like talk to them. But I think, you know... Like, I think that's a smart thing to say, that yeah. we say, we don't... We're like, if it happens, it happens. Yeah, but I think those guys are like that, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think the guys... I think that, they just want to play, yeah? I think the guys are in there, like, hey, you know, like... I, I, I believe they feel like if they go back now and not, like, they were as old, then they just, like, let the game go. You get mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't see a lot of them saying, hey, unless the NBA come and try, like, nobody's going to just turn it down money. You know, like, you're not going to come to me and I'm 43 and say, hey... Like, we want to give you fifteen million for the next three years, and I'll be like, all right, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm gonna just say, well, okay, well, you know what you're gonna get, you know, what I'm saying like, all right, but like, and getting twenty four grand, team, like, honestly, that thing could probably take off. Like, I can see a lot of people getting like ownership, and especially after the first couple of seasons or whatever go good, I can see that happen because it's something to do after the NBA and the, the season, idea right? is cool because there's no home teams. I use quotes that because yeah. it's technically home teams, but they're traveling around essentially, which is really cool. Yeah. I think that's a that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's what I like. Honestly, you can try out Elvin. Send in your highlight film. No, I'm not trying out for that. <laughs> I'm not trying out for that at all. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So far, I guess that's that's it for our podcast right now. For all the people watching on Gizmo TV, what's up? What's up? Um, yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Perennial Landscaping, or one of our official sponsors. They're a great landscaping company based out of Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. If you need to get in contact for any landscaping work, please contact me on Facebook at Ethan Ziltner. Um, yeah, shout out to my boy Mike, my mommy, um, my kitty Jasmine, and everybody else listening. You got any shout outs, Elvin, or no? I don't know. I just want to say, you know, just thank everybody for listening. Um, just tune in. We got a lot of exciting stuff coming. So yeah. you don't want to miss that. All right. Well, everyone have a good day. Peace.